Scientific Chicago is made possible in part by the Motorola Foundation. You may not know what carbonaceous chondrite is, but what might surprise you is that it could contain the answer to a very big question. An SUV-sized meteorite that fell in Nevada last month is made of carbonaceous chondrite, and a piece of it is now in the hands of the Field Museum for study. It may answer how life formed on Earth. And joining us with the meteorite itself is Jim Holstein, the Field Museum's collection manager for meteorites and physical geology. Welcome to Chicago tonight. Nice to have Thank you. Thank you for here. having me. And you actually have a piece of this, which I think is very cool. I this do. came from outer space. It landed <laughs> last month. That's right. April in, in Nevada. Now I said an SUV. In California, site. actually. In, uh, in the in the Sierra Nevada. Mm -hmm. Is that where, mm -hmm. where it is? That's where we're sighted. And I mentioned that it was a. Um, an SUV sized, but you have it in uh, something that looks like an index card Isn't holder. Isn't that tiny? So <laughs> did it burn up on entry or how they did it break apart in the atmosphere? They hit the atmosphere with such velocity and they get superheated as they enter the atmosphere and they explode. And what happens is these pieces then rain down all over the countryside, creating what's called a strewn field. And these strewn fields are oval shaped fields uh, of debris, meteorite debris. And so people can go looking for these right, things I mean, in the strewn I'm fields. Move this out of the way while you're talking about just and, in case. And so it was a, a meteorite bounty hunter essentially that went in search of yeah, this. Yeah, meteorite right? collectors, they um, uh, look for these things and then they sell them on the open market. And fortunately, we have a, a, a donor, Terry Boudreau, who purchased pieces of this meteorite for our collection so we can study them. Now let's, can we get it out of hey, the, 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 um, the case here? And as you're doing that, tell us what, where this meteorite uh, came from. As it came from where most meteorites come from, which is in the asteroid belt. And that is in between which two planets? Mars and Jupiter. That's right. I know that. So about <laughs> how far away is that uh, well, look, that we're I'm talking about? an incredible about. hope in my gloves. Yeah, we're both wearing uh, these, these gloves because we don't want to uh, contaminate the sample. Is that right? That's right. You don't want to get any moisture on them at all. Uh, no human contamination at all. So I'm going to open this up, and these come from way out in the asteroid belt. There's different types of meteorites in the asteroid belt. There's well, different types of asteroids. Well, let me ask you about that, because mm -hmm. as I mentioned, this is carbonaceous chondrite. Mm -hmm. what, is, uh, what is that? As the name implies, it has a lot of carbon in them, but they also have a lot of water in them as well. And they have silicate minerals, they have oxide minerals, and they have a whole bunch of other things we're going to talk about as well. And look at this little guy. And it, it just looks like look a regular stone. It, it actually kind of looks like a little piece of, uh, uh, like a, um, uh, a briquette, you know, that you, grill, does, that you grill on. <laughs> but this, um, this came from outer space, mm -hmm. and it's not going to turn me into a mothra or anything like that with its radiation well, or anything like that. Well, we don't know that yet. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out we'll. soon, right? There's nothing... Um, only we can harm the meteorites. They, necess they ne don't necessarily harm us. Now, how does this potentially hold the answer to life on Earth? That's one question to answer of many. Uh, what's really interesting about these types of meteorites is that they contain amino acid. And as we know, amino acids, they form protein strings. And these post-protein strings actually form genetic code. So one theory that was put forth was that uh, these building blocks formed in space and seeded the planet Earth at the right time. Just think about all these ingredients in a recipe uh, floating around out there. And then these ingredients land on Earth, and the Earth had the right conditions for life to form. It hit the oven at the right temperature, and then you're baking a pie of people, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's a theory, of course. This dates from about four to five billion years ago the when, uh, when the solar system mm -hmm. was forming. The exact date is 4.568 billion years old. <laughs> Well, pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. um, thankfully, something is on the set that's older than me for a change. Uh, and how you will cut into this, and what exactly will you be looking at? Well, first at thing for? we're going to do, we're going to try to categorize what type of meteorite it is, what specific type. Um, it's part of a larger group of meteorites called uh, stony meteorites. And when we at the Field Museum, all the scientists all around the world love to do is split hairs and re-identify things. There are subtle variations in these carbonaceous chondrites that will separate from other carbonaceous chondrites. So that's the first step, is to characterize what type of carbonaceous chondrite it is. 
and then we can do further study from there. One such study is looking for amino acids. Uh, I have another meteor I'm going to show you that has 70 amino acids. Uh, tell us about that other oh, meteorite boy. that you have. Yeah, this one is really, really cool. Look at this one. That's a big charcoal briquette, isn't it? Now, is that also, <laughs> yes, uh, you could grill several hamburgers with yeah. that. Uh, <laughs> does that, is that also a carbonaceous convent? It is, and this one fell in Australia in 1969, and this is one of the most studied meteorites in the world. Here, I'll trade with you. You can take the Kingsford I'll hold this one. one now. And it just feels like a, a regular rock. Uh, not it does. Uh, There's nothing like heavy, heavy about metal. it. There's other types of meteorites called ordinary chondrites that can have up to 30% uh, iron, and those are heavier than ordinary earth rocks. So it's you can tell you, you have a meteorite sometimes by the sheer weight of it, but that's no heavier because it has, doesn't have the metal content in it. There were meteorites that landed in Wisconsin mm -hmm. just a couple of years ago that you also obtained, right? Yeah, in 2010, um, a meteorite called Mifflin. It's an ordinary chondrite found in Wisconsin, and, and the and same what's donor. the difference between those meteorites and this one? Uh, mainly, the other ones have more metal in them, uh, a different, slightly different mineral suite in it, but this has more organic compounds in it, and those are the biggest difference between the two of those. And so when you look for those organic compounds, mm -hmm. what exactly will tell you this might be the, the key ingredient to life beginning on Earth? Well, they've, like I said, they've identified about 70 organic compounds, including several acids and amino acids, that actually do form proteins. So that's already been confirmed with that. And, uh, there and might you be have some your little test kit here. Tell us how that kit. works. <laughs> so this is actually from another carbonaceous chondrite. I'm going to trade with you again. You All can right. look at this one. And this one's really interesting. The other serious question we want to answer is talking about pre-solar uh, grains. And this is stardust. Stardust. Yeah, hold that. The, the Hoagie Carmichael variety. Do you see um, the clear liquid is water, and then the white material at the bottom are about a trillion nanodiamonds. You're holding a trillion nanodiamonds right now. Well, it still wouldn't <laughs> make a very impressive ring. But no, it would not. <laughs> what, what does this tell you? Well, this tells us about what went on in our universe before the formation of our solar system. Like we talked about, the formation of our solar system was 4.5 billion years ago, and the universe, the Big Bang, was about 13 billion years ago. But there's a big time period in between the two that we don't know a lot about. And this tells us a lot about the birth, the life, and death of stars during that time period. W what specifically does it tell you? Okay, for example, those pre-solar diamonds, um, there are several theories as to how those were formed. And one theory, one of the newest theories, is that those, those are organic carbon particles floating around in space, and they were actually converted into diamonds by a shock wave, a shock wave that was caused by a supernova, a star exploding, creating these solar, uh, pre-solar diamonds. And another type of um, grain is called silicon carbide, and that grain is really interesting because it tells us a lot about different types of stars. It gives us the abundances of different types of stars out there, roughly where they were in the universe. So it's telling us a lot about basically mapping out uh, solar uh, evolution in our universe. There are 300, um, let's see, what's, how many numbers is that? 300 and add 21 zeros after that. That's how many stars there are in our solar system. And so we're just starting to scratch well, the surface. Well, not our solar system. You're uh, in the universe. In the rather. universe, yeah. yes. So 300. If there were that many stars in our universe, we'd be in our solar system. We'd be a lot warmer trouble. than we mm -hmm. are now. Yeah, we look like this charcoal briquette. <laughs> <laughs> when you cut into this latest meteorite and you find, hopefully, uh, these these compounds, these organic compounds, mm -hmm. how will you know if you have an answer for whether life was the ingredients for life on Earth actually came from outer space? Well, the ingredients are already there. I mean, there's no doubt that the ingredients are already there. Whether or not they help seed life, that remains a theory. And, uh, and we, so what will it take to answer take, that question? That is a very good question, and I don't know what it'll take at this point to uh, definitively answer that question, um, because we have to connect both these particles to life on Earth, these uh, amino acids to life on Earth, and I think we've done so for the most part, but there's no definitive way to say that these meteors, in fact, bombarded the Earth and sometime during its history, and then life followed. Will it take it's more meteorites? Right now. Yeah, definitely take more meteorites to answer that and a whole lot of other questions that we're trying to answer with these meteorites. Maybe a meteorite with actually uh, some alien life form, <laughs> ET, in it will finally <laughs> oh, answer awesome. the question. That hasn't happened yet, though. You'll bring that in. I'll definitely bring it, it in, though. and I'll name him Eddie. <laughs> hey, I, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for being with thank us tonight. Thank you for having me tonight. It. I, I hate to give up the stardust, especially with all those diamonds yeah, in there. Yeah, that's right. That's a great engagement ring. <laughs> Thanks so much. For a photo gallery of the meteorite and to watch a, vid a video of meteorite hunters, you can visit our website. Up next, a look at the creative work of Chicago artist Nick Cave.
Supporting science and discovery in Chicago, the Elizabeth Morris Genius Charitable Trust is the lead underwriter of Scientific Chicago and is a major supporter of all science programming produced and presented by WTTW.